indeed my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this morning. And I, I'd like to just say that yesterday uh, I reminded him, I said, Bill, it's already the time that I asked you to speak. It's been months, and here it is. It's time. He goes, I know. It was over the back fence. I said yes, in a blizzard. <laughs> Please welcome Bill Ferdin from the AIDS support group of Cape Cod, as well as from the back side of my house. <laughs> Okay, hi. <laughs> well, greetings and, um, and welcome friends, visitors and residents uh, to the Meeting House. Uh, again, my name is Bill Ferdin. On the very first day I started working with people with AIDS, I was scared. My best friend said to me at the time, you only need to help one person and then you can quit. <laughs> she <laughs> said, and if you help others, the rest is garnish. The scaffolding holds the arch in place till the keystone is put in to stay. Then the scaffolding comes out, then the arch stands strong as all the massed pressing parts of the arch and loose, any, loose as any sag or spread. Failing of the builder's intention, hope. The arch never sleeps, living in union it holds so long as each piece does its work. The arch is alive, singing a restless choral. My first experience um, with, with Provincetown was with my seventh grade art teacher, Dee Kennedy, who was also Unitarian. We became friends when she learned I was helping senior citizens on Saturday mornings in a poor nursing home making pre-poured ceramics. We lived in Waltham, Massachusetts, and she was my teacher until the ninth grade when I transitioned to the high school, and lucky for me, she moved with me. I stopped taking her classes in high school, and we became very close. Not that close, <laughs> but good friends. She was a wonderful person, an example for me at 13. I watched her and her husband pull all types of garbage old tires and grocery carts out of the Charles River. They organized one of the first river cleanups in the state. She also protested Raytheon Corporation in Waltham, marched in front of the building with a sign, stop making weapons. Her husband, a physicist for the company, tucked deep in the bowels of the plant. And when he would come home from work, she would say to him, honey, how was bomb building today? which he would reply, terrific, sweetie, how was the protest? <laughs> uh, I once watched her chain uh, herself to a tree on Ash Street to save the old trees from being cut down. They were being replaced with new sidewalks, and she won. Now the, oak, the old oak trees stop right at her front door. Dee knew I was sensitive and different. She saw kids in school over the years taunt me, mock me, and she would drive me home sometimes when I couldn't take a minute more from the bullies and thugs from the daily bus ride from hell. How did kids know I was gay before I did? Very strange. I, <laughs> I plotted periodically ways to end my life. It was a struggle and torment, and she feared the outcome. In the summer of 1981, when I just graduated the 11th grade, she said to me, why don't you come to Provincetown for the weekend? I rented a place for the summer on Cottage Street. You can help me hang an art show at the greenery. So at 16, I boarded the boat and headed to Provincetown. When I arrived, uh, she met me at the pier and shocked me with all kinds of questions. There are a lot of gay people here. What are you going to do if a gay person comes up to you on the street? How are you going to do, uh, right, right. You are not going out alone at night. This was very unlike her and terrified. We walked home. When we got there, she needed cigarettes and asked me to go to the store, which was then Simon's Deli. As I walked down Tremont Street, I was so frightened of the place. 
the unknown of the gays. And to be completely honest, I thought they were going to jump out of the bushes and cut my penis off. <laughs> But when I got to the bend uh, in, commer on, in Commercial Street by Perry's Liquor Store, and saw, I, saw, I then saw two men walking arm in arm past me. And at that moment, I admitted to myself I was gay. As I got closer and closer to the deli, I kept s saying it more and more, I'm gay, I'm gay. And it was such a relief. So confident now, I marched into the store, asked for the smokes, and said to the clerk behind the counter, I'm gay. <laughs> and he said, who cares? <laughs> um, and that was when I first fell in love with Provincetown. <laughs> Uh, little did I know I had just begun my romance with the town and I had no idea just how special it was. Uh, just how special the place really was. Uh, I moved to Manhattan for college and pursued a career in art therapy. I went to the School of Visual Arts on 23rd Street, a hip and up and coming private art school. I had completed internships with the Mentally Challenged, worked in Bellevue Hospital and Adult Psychiatric, and with children on the Staten Island Zoo. In my senior year in college, I saw an ad in the newspaper for nurses um, who wanted to work with people with AIDS. The hospital was St. Clair's Hospital, and it was located in Hell's Kitchen on the Upper West Side, a Catholic-run hospital in a poor neighborhood with an innovative idea to coordinate a new ward just for people with AIDS. Now, I know some of you are thinking quarantine, but that was not the case. In 1986, there were a lot of fear and misinformation around the disease and questions about transmission. So your care in any hospital in the country could be inconsistent. Sometimes your room is cleaned, other times food not delivered, maybe a blood pressure check skipped. Lots of fear. I thought our therapy may be able to help those folks, so I put together a proposal for two days a week to help men and women deal with death and dying through visualization. It was very successful, so successful I was hired full-time after graduation. Uh, back then there was nothing to treat the disease. Uh, diagnosis to death, in some cases, six months. After a year of full-time employment and assisted about 650 deaths, I needed to get away. So I came back to Provincetown for vacation stayed with Dee and thought about some of the lessons I was learning from all this work. I recalled one specific client named Saturnino who said to me, Bill, I don't know if you have this disease or not. Um, I don't know if that, but you better live your life to the fullest and be where you want to be. I would, he said, I would do anything to return to Puerto Rico and my family. So I thought of that, talked to Dee, and moved into her condominium here in Provincetown. It was August 1988, and I was 22 years old. I thought I would try Provincetown for six months. Unfortunately, there wasn't a great need for art therapy here in town at the time, so I worked at a shop called The Handcrafter, selling turquoise jewelry, hair barrettes, pewter dog keychains to Taurus and eventually Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> the work wasn't that challenging, and to be uh, completely honest, I missed working uh, with people with AIDS. There was an ad in The Advocate for a client advocate at the Provincetown AIDS Support Group. I applied, got the job, and began working on April Fool's Day, 1989. Not quite sure what to think about that date. <laughs> The AIDS support group at that time had about 15 clients and 200 volunteers. Our primary goal was to assist the client um, where they were at that time. In some cases by coordinating home care, providing educational forms, volunteer rides to Boston hospitals, and, or assist with food. But the bottom line is to help the client live and die with some dignity. Many of our clients lost their families from either fear of the disease or hatred of the homosexual. But now they were very visual out and in front. 
I can still remember walking into the support group for the first time. It was basically one big room with a mixed match second hand furniture. To be completely honest, it looked like a bad yard sale. <laughs> We hadn't opened the office to the public yet, and one of the first tasks came from our executive director and co-founder of the agency, Alice Foley. She said, Bill, could you get on the phone and call Franco's, Snug Harbor, Front Street, and the A&P, and see if they will donate some finger food for the opening? I looked at her horrified, and I said, they're just going to give it to us for free? <laughs> and they did. I have been so fortunate to work with some of the best people on the planet, citizens of our town coming together at the worst of times, donating food, money, time, an empathetic ear, or a wheelchair ramp to be built, a dog walked, 24-hour home care, massages for free, homemade afghans, rides to the doctors, rides to social security, shoveling, cleaning, laundry, food prep, phone answering, meal deliveries, the list goes on. I know some of you have never seen the face of AIDS, but let me tell you something. I have, and when you lose your ability to fight off infections, many horrible diseases raise their ugly heads. There are infections like CMV retinitis that could make you blind. Awful. Another, you lose your mind, sort of a type of fast-moving Alzheimer's. Weight loss, well, that's a given. But I think Carposi sarcoma was the opportunistic infection that clients feared the most. That particular infection was a brutal visual one. For those in the room unaware, it was a form of cancer. Raised purple blotches would appear. It would start off slow, but then it would begin to spread. And the clients would pray it would not hit their face but in many cases it did. In our office here on Bradford Street, there is a painting, a self-portrait hanging in our hall called The Purple Man, and I welcome you to stop by and look at it. I once had a client, Daniel, who asked for financial assistance to purchase a specific breed of dog. Now, Daniel was covered in Carposi sarcoma, his face swollen purple. I can still see the lesions pressing against the frames of his glasses. And he said, Bill, this is my idea. If I get a dog, people don't have to look right at me. I can use the dog as a type of diversion, and they may want to talk to me. It might make it easier for them. And I thought, make it easier for them? Um, I know Memorial Day is our country's specific day dedicated to those veterans that have died fighting for our freedoms, which I am so grateful for. But I also think of AIDS as a terrible battle, a war where many men and women lost their lives also fighting, but fighting in a different way. Practically lab rats taking medications in huge unheard of doses, not given the, the appropriate time to be tested, Medications were released, but time was the only thing we didn't have. Trying alternative treatments, hoping something would slow this machine down. Egg lipids, ginger root, echinacea, urine therapy, fish oils, vitamins, to name a few. I was talking recently to my executive director, Joe Carlio, about some of these treatments, and he had a friend who put photo-developing liquid on his arms, which was to cause a rash, hoping to jumpstart the immune system and save his life. And by the late 1990s, they all did begin to save lives, unfortunately not their own. But they gave their lives for the advancement of treatment and medication protocols causing a much longer life expectancy. They brought homophobia out of the closets of America because when you got AIDS, what the, who the hell cares if you tiptoe around your parents about telling them you're gay? You got bigger fish to fry. They were the brave ones. The volunteers that helped with end-stage life care or tolerated a vomiting client while driving them to a medical appointment in Boston to be the family that was lost, they were brave. The residents of the town who pitched in and did what they can do, bake sales, lodging donations, um, to, raise, to raise money. The, the old lady at the Portuguese bakery said to me once, if you need a cake, pastry, anything for a service, you let me know. And they were brave because we all didn't know 
what was going to happen. But we did know these were our friends and neighbors, and we are going to help them no matter what. I am so proud to be a resident of Provincetown. I continue to see wonderful acts of human kindness on a daily basis. We are still here at the support group in the shadow of this building, me 26 years later trying to make a difference to take the navigation burden of the new health care system from a newly diagnosed person or help with food stamps, fuel assistance, daily lunches. We are still out there on the streets for the tourists spreading prevention messages. We now have over 240 year-round residents in the Lower Cape. We remain one of the highest HIV incident rates in the state. 11% of our year-round population is infected with HIV. AIDS is still, unfortunately, right here. I know why I call Promise Town my home. It is the brave town, and I can't imagine living anywhere else. I did move here, I didn't move here, I'm sorry, I didn't move here for the whales. I moved here for the people. They are the best. <laughs>